good, Dolores? Good evening. Welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting of Monday, June 5th, 2017. Anthony, if you could lead us. Dolores. Councillor Bellow. Here. Councillor Hammond. Here. Councillor Hurley. Here. Councillor Latina. Here. Councillor Martino. Here. Councillor Rell is unable to attend. Councillor Spinella. Here. Deputy Mayor Barry. Here. And Mayor Montaneri. Thank you, Dolores. Here. Uh, we'll go into public comment. Anybody here this evening wishing to speak on any topic of interest? Gus? Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, where do I start? I'm still not convinced that I have received all the answer to the question of what a stop sign will not be installed on Morrison Avenue. You have told me that I have all the answers to the questions I've asked on numerous occasions. I truly believe that the reason that the town has given me are just a bunch of excuses. A little history. I have point out that the original design and construction of Morrison Avenue was never meant to connect to Silas Dean Highway. It was connected to Silas Dean Highway around 1955. Hillcrest Avenue before that time was connected. So before that, all the traffic from Walker Hill to Silas Dean used Hillcrest Avenue. Let me compare again Morrison Avenue and Hill Hillcrest Avenue. Morrison Avenue is 24 feet wide, 24 feet wide, curb to curb. Hillcrest Avenue is 30 feet wide. Nice. Morrison Avenue has a three foot grass strip except in places where there is none. Hillcrest Avenue on the other hand has 15 foot strip, 10 foot minimum. It's kind of nice, beautiful frontage. Morrison Avenue has an average daily traffic of 730 cars. This was taken by the time. Hillcrest Avenue has an average daily traffic of 365. The distance from the curb to the front of the houses for Morrison Avenue is approximately 38 feet. For Hillcrest Avenue, the distance is approximately 60 feet. So that means those houses, they sit quite far back. Why? because Morrison Avenue was never meant to connect to Silas Dean, was supposed to be a dead end street. The intersection side distance for Orchard at Hillcrest is 344 feet to the east and 970 feet to the west. The intersection has three stop signs. The intersection for Orchard Street and Morrison Avenue is 290 feet to the east. This intersection has two stop signs. The intersection side distance for Tifton now, Tifton Road is just 100 feet to the east of Orchard. It's 232 feet to the west. The intersection has a stop sign, not on Morrison Avenue. At the February meeting, the mayor stated the following, quote, the council does not have the authority to authorize the placement of any stop signs by charter, the council does not have that power, and it is the state's prerogative to make the decision and to report as being reviewed and examined by our local police with the state agency." <laughs> End quote. I've been, uh, when the reconstruction of the intersection of Main Street and Church Street took place last year, two additional stop signs were installed on Main Street approach. Did the town go to the state and ask permission to install the two additional stop signs? I don't think so. Was a traffic engineering study prepared for this, this location? The manual on uniform traffic control device and endorsed by the police report dated May 21st, 2009, eight years ago, states the following, a stop sign should not be installed on the major street unless justified by a traffic engineering study. I did inquire with the consultant that designed the revised intersection on Main Street and Church to see if there were any traffic study done to see 
if a stop sign war warranted. I also checked the engineering office in town, and they did not have any record of any studies. Now, I don't understand. A stop sign on a minor street requires a state permit and a traffic study, and two stop signs on a major street, which is Main Street, does not require anything? Why? Quote, again, Hillcrest and the side streets have a stop sign, and he's correct, that's me, that's the mayor's talking again. It may not make a lot of sense why there is a stop sign and Morrison does not have it one. He cannot go back 25 years and figure out what was a play when they put the stop sign there, but they don't make a, a practice of removing stop signs, and there will really only be alternative when you look at the safety reports and materials provided by the state. I've been talking, I talked to a lot of people and whatnot. I think those two stop signs were installed many, many years ago because too many kids were playing on the street and to make it safer for the, the kids. That's why they installed those two stop signs. Those kids are no longer there. Those kids are probably are my age or maybe 10 years younger. Orchard Street as a four residence and theoretical two ways out, Morrison and Hillcrest. Tifton, on the other hand, has 19 residents and only one way out. No stop signs at all on Morrison Avenue. Why is that? Does it make any sense? To me, it doesn't. And I like to ask nothing against the people on Hillcrest Avenue, but says, how many times do they see the Lamour trucks going by? Probably never. In my street, on my street, at least five times every day. Why? Because there is a stop sign and Hillcrest Avenue doesn't. The stop signs at Hillcrest Avenue does not increase traffic on Morrison Avenue, making the road less safe. It does increase. Remember, the average daily traffic on Morrison Avenue is twice as much. Again, 290 feet distance requires a stop sign, in 200, and 232 feet from Tifton does not require any stop signs, and also the traffic goes a 6% down. I don't understand at all. Where is the logic? By state standards, a stop sign is needed in the eastbound direction since the intersection side distance is only for good for 24 miles per hour. The posted speed is 25, and the 85th percentile is 31 miles per hour. Remember that before the reconstruction of the sidewalk, there was no problem with the intersectional side distance on Tifton. The town has created a problem, and if something happens on this location, the town is liable for the consequences. Now, after all this, I still do not understand why the town refuses to install a stop sign that is required by the standards. It's behind comprehension. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Anyone else wishing to speak? Public comment, Tom? Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. <clears throat> Tonight's agenda includes replacement uh, of the synthetic surface at Catone's Field. <clears throat> Maybe I uh, misunderstood the outcome of the last council meeting. From what I gathered, uh, you approved the budget, but it's still up in the air because we don't know the amount of state funding that we will or will not receive. Given the uncertainty of the town's finances, why are we proposing to spend a million plus dollars on the surface replacement at the field? Depending on how things shake out at the state level, we may need <clears throat> that money for something much more critical to the town's operation than the field surface. There seems to be a got to get it done attitude about the field. If you don't approve this tonight, then the field won't be ready for the first practice in August. Maybe you need to slow down and review everything. In the agenda item comments, it's stated that the financing will be brought to the council meeting on June 19th. So you're going to approve a project tonight, 
but you're not sure how it'll be financed or what the exact numbers are going to be. That, that's just beyond me. I, I don't understand it. Some other things that I'm not clear about and I think a lot of other people have questions about. Uh, when the field was replaced in 2002-2003, there were discussions about revenue from leasing the field and gate receipts and that those receipts would go towards the acquisition cost and the maintenance of the field. That turned out not to be the case. Uh, the gate receipts for the various uh, high school events actually go to the Board of Ed, and I don't believe the Board of Ed contributes any money towards the field maintenance or the acquisition of the field. Uh, the lease rentals for the field uh, from what I've heard have been used to offset the cost of the lighting. So that, that fund is depleted. So is any, anything going to be put in place whereby these receipts do go into a maintenance fund or, or, or a fund to replace the field the next time around? Because the, the field's only going to last 10 to 14 years again. We're going to be in the same exact position of going for capital. There's no money for the field. Assuming that the uh, you finance the thing out at at the seven or eight years, and let's assume that we end up getting 14 years out of the field, maybe wishful thinking, you're still looking at $90,000 a year to operate that field. Um, have we taken a real good look at the the revenues from the uh, Board of Ed for the pay to play. Uh, the hockey team, as an example, they need an expensive facility. They they lease ice time at uh, Newington. I think it's three seventy five or four hundred dollars an hour for ice time. The pay to play for the hockey athletes is four hundred dollars. The pay to play for the football and soccer athletes is sixty or seventy dollars. Why not? up the fees for the pay to play they're going to be play, playing on a beautiful surface have the students kick in more money to play and get the board of education to turn that money over to the town i think the board of education should actually split the cost of that field it's not a high school it's a field uh, i don't see why the town has to foot the bill for all the maintenance in the restoration of the field. And I'd like to see somebody look at the numbers of the utilization of the field. How many spectators even go to games? I myself haven't gone to game in quite a few years, but you know, you're spending a lot of money for a relatively small amount of people utilizing the field. And you know, I fully support athletics. I participated when I was in school. Uh, I think it's a great thing. Um, but, you know, you have to weigh the cost versus what you're getting out of it. Did, did we take a real hard look at synthetic fields versus real turf? Uh, there's a lot of information out there that you can look at studies. Uh, NFL teams, for example, there's more fields now that are uh, real grass than synthetic. They're actually going back to real grass. For some of the in, uh, items that you brought up, injuries, the heat of the field, and so on, real grass is in a lot of respects a benefit. In Weathersfield, we're, we're home to one of the premier turf producers in the Northeast. Did anybody even ask the Morgans if they wanted to throw a ballpark number out there of what it would cost to put real grass back on the field? I don't think so. It's just let's go with what we, you know, what's there. Um, also, when the field was put in in 2002, 2003, I honestly believe everybody thought we were putting the best possible surface down that we could come up with. 
Now, 14 years later, we're finding out there's compaction issues. The field's hard. It's extremely hot in the summertime. Uh, so there's another $212,000 in here to improve the subsurface and to, uh, I guess, coat the rubber infill material. So you're shaking your head no. If I'm wrong, could you correct me? Something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Hi, <clears throat> Christy Salters Pedno, 15 Fairmont Street. Um, I really just came up uh, mainly to say thank you to the town council. I attended my first town council meeting, I think in January. It's my first time being involved in any way in town politics. And um, having now been to uh, my fair share of meetings and watched the town council through the budget process, um, I want to say that my, my dominant um, reaction to all of it has been gratitude. Um, the town council was handed a really difficult fiscal situation and has uh, really listened to the constituents of the town. Um, I feel really pleased with um, what you all came up with. I think it's responsible. I think it really paid attention to uh, the most vulnerable people in town. Um, so I think uh, you all volunteer a lot of time and don't hear a lot of gratitude. So I just want to say thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Other public comment this evening? Bob? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I, I'm just like Tom, trying to figure out how this whole budget thing is going to go be going forward. We're looking at a state of Connecticut that f helps fund our town. And from what I'm reading, you're not, they don't want to hear from you people anymore. <clears throat> you want, you want, you want, as an article indicated with uh, the new chairman of the House of Representatives up at the state capitol. And I don't blame them. Uh, but they're, 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 they're like the pot calling the kettle black when they criticize somebody else because they are actually worse. Tonight, Tom brought up a subject on turf. And 20 years, 15, 14 years ago, we've, we've had turf on that field. We've also expected to see a return coming from that. The return has been pathetic coming off of that field. There's other sports that do fair, but the sports that you can identify to Catone Field are terrible. You either are, a, and we keep hearing that you're a great sports town. People don't support your great sports that are going on in town, Mayor. Or they're coming to these games and they're not paying. Because when you look at the gate receipts and you see $12,000 for the entire year, $14,000 for the entire year, but then some thousands go back to some other group. Some check is written to send the money somewhere else. It doesn't pay to have a business like that, Mayor. You either make money or you you drop it. And by putting turf back on that field, I think it's a, a big mistake. I know that town manager and I have had some discussions on that. And he's of a total different other belief. But I don't think we need it. I don't think we need to spend this kind of money. We don't have it. For your however in the world you're going to pay for it, that's another big question. And I know in the past, 
few months, you've mentioned you're going to finance it, whether it's so many years, three, four, eight years, something like that, and push it out to make it make another what we call um, well, a fixed cost. This town is loaded with fixed costs, and it shouldn't be. You fix cost your vehicles, you fix cost your trucks, you fix cost your bulldozers, uh, payloaders, and backhoes, and turf, and, 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 and every other darn thing. And, you, and, you, and when you leave, you leave a mountain of debt. Same like the rodent that we have up in the state of Connecticut who runs the state. He's a rodent. Another word is a rat. He's going to leave in a couple years with us. When he came in, we had $60 billion in debt. When he leaves at this point, if he left now, we have $74.3 billion in debt. And when he leaves, his hands are clean. He walks away, and, and we owe it. All these people, including those who are not here, are going to owe it. And the way things are going in this state, there won't be many people left to help pay for those bills. You know, we just saw, well, 8,300, it was reported in the paper, 8,300 people have left Harford. We blame, we blame uh, every different reason why we're not collecting enough taxes to support our greedy habits. We even go as low as mentioning in the newspaper that Donald Trump is the problem, why Connecticut's not taking in enough money, because investors are waiting for his new tax plan, which will never occur. But this is the cheap excuses they use to get someone to read the article. And then as you read further into the article, Mayor, here's, here's what the bottom line is. They talk, and we all hear about this thing called the one percenters, the billionaires and millionaires and those kind of people. They represent 1% of our population, 1%. And they're paying 36% of the tax bill that Harford collects in money. There's another group, the lower end, is 50% 50 50 of people who pay no state income taxes. None at all, 50% of them. And then, of course, there's the 49%, those working people, like myself and, and most of you that work. I know we're not all, we're not, I don't think there's anybody here making uh, the, in the millionaire club, but maybe there is. But the fact is, the, re the, the, the rest of us sitting here are 49% of the state that are paying taxes, and that represents 64% of what income taxes are collected in the state of Connecticut. Now, we just read in the paper, 8,300 people left the state. That wasn't 8,300 millionaires that left the state. It was probably a couple hands full of millionaires that left the state, and all the other 8,000 were the people like us that left the state. People who pay taxes, whenever the 50 percenters, the 50 percent population that I spoke about that was in this new article, will next year become 52 and 53 and 55 percent. And in the meantime, you folks will be running up our tab, and you've already run it up. You've already run it up to a point where the 83 who left, there's, there's more than 83 going out next year. And they're just going to keep going, and it's going to increase. And getting back to the money, which is something I always talk about, you're going to have a serious problem. And again, as I've said, Mayor, this is your economy. It's like the rat up in Hartford who has put us into this position. We lost, we're hearing about Aetna now leaving, their corporate group. We, we saw General Electric leave. There's others who are leaving. I'm talking to people who are buying properties right now 
in North Carolina. They're getting the heck out of here. And they're down on the coast. And they don't want any more part of this. They see nothing but a big money grab coming from the whole state. And the whole state is so hungry. And they put us into this position. Anybody that holds, has a house, and, and I know you and I have had a disagreement on the cost of, or the prices of homes, but I don't see how they're going to continue going anywhere but down. And the last person turn off the light. But getting back to the turf, I don't believe that we need turf. Bob, can you um, save your thoughts for the second five? I'm sorry? Could you save your thoughts for the second five minutes? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Other comments? Dave? Good evening, David DeCarly, 7 Monticello Drive. Here's the deal. High schools in every town are the hub of a community. They are. It's where all the action is, where you have your dance recitals, where you have your sports, it's where you have your events, it's where your kids all eventually go through unless you send them to private school or parochial school. Athletics and busing drives high schools. We like to think it's curriculum, we like to think it's instruction, but it's sports, for better or for worse, and it's extracurricular activities. We know that students that are involved in schools perform better. That's a fact, you can look it up. And research shows that. With that said, I'm here just to simply say that turf is a must. If we don't do the turf, then there's gonna be a caution tape around Catone and the field's gonna be shut down. There's been far too much research and far too much information that's been put out there to the town of Weathersfield and to the town, account, to the town council that has said that the field is no longer safe to play on. Whether it's concussions, whether it's my daughter's knee injury that she's just six months recovered from now and she's looking forward to playing finally, to the up and coming, upcoming lacrosse team um, that will be down the line in their sport. The high schools, our high school field, it's the hub. It's where things happen. So gate receipts, maybe they don't offset the cost of that. Maybe they offset the cost of police and they offset the cost of different people that have to work there. It is what it is. There's expenses, towns have expenses. And so we have to do the turf. A few years ago, we had to, the town had to shut down um, Big Dean, Big Dean uh, soccer field because of uh, some fill that was in there that was, wasn't safe. It raised cane with all of the rescheduling and the sports. And that's just one soccer field for the George D. Ritchie program. You, you shut down a high school's field, never mind a little catone and what eventually could be the softball field, it's, it's gonna be a catastrophe. And again, I go back to what the town council is looking for and looking to do, and they're looking to support uh, particularly our youth of today and the youth of today that are more active, that are more involved, particularly in extracurriculars at the high school level and at the youth level are more successful in school. And that's what we want in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Other comments? Dan? Uh, Dan O'Connor, 49 Broad Street. Um, two f uh, subjects I want to address. First is um, I had an opportunity to see some of you on Friday night at the Mayor's Ball, and I have to tell you it was a great time, great cause. Uh, it was nice to see all the R's and D's getting along. In fact, I was pretty convinced at one point I converted Tony over to the R side, but <laughs> he may not feel the same way. I sure did. But uh, it was a great time, and it was, it was for a good cause. Um, and it was top-notch, well-run. So kudos to all that were involved in that and the volunteers that made that happen. Uh, tonight I'm here to actually talk about Catone Field and my support for that. My support is a taxpayer. My support is president of the Weathersfield Youth Lacrosse Program. My support as a coach in the Youth Football League and former board member of the Youth Football League. Um, Catone Field is one of the most popular, used, most widely used fields in the town. When that field was brought in uh, and the turf was put on, what was there before was a dismal, embarrassing mess. I remember um, 
coaching a football game, a youth football game there, and the referee came up to me and says, you guys seriously play on this field? And I looked at him, and his ankles were buried in mud, and we were on the 50-yard line in the middle of the field. Now, that's a youth football program, and the town we were playing goes home and says, God, what a dump Weathersfield was. And then I started thinking, what about all the high schools that come here? I mean, let's face it, we have a beautiful high school. The renovations, I had an opportunity to take a tour. It was a beautiful, top-notch job, um, well, well done. But most people aren't going to go inside the school. They're going to get their reflection of the town of Wethersfield when they go and watch their children play sports. And when they go down and see this brand-new turf with this beautiful W logo, and they see that, wow, Wethersfield really takes care of its facilities and shows a lot of pride in it. That's what drives people to our town. We can have a $10 billion high school with every state-of-the-art bell and whistle, but 99% of the people that come to Wethersfield aren't going to be inside the high school to see that. They're going to judge us based on the field that they went to watch their child play on. And that field should speak volumes for the type of town we are. So I wholeheartedly support that. Um, I could answer most of the questions that were brought up about the difference in cost between turf and grass and why the turf makes sense. I mean, we as a town are incredibly fortunate that when we did put the turf in, we got the best turf that was available and something that was supposed to have an eight-year life cycle ended up having 14 years. I mean, you know, do that with your tires if you can get away with that. Uh, that's a pretty good return on our investment. And so as you go through the bids and you decide which one you're going to go with, I would highly encourage that we go with, you know, the one which would we feel the most comfortable with and not necessarily the one that's the cheapest because I do think we have a great track record with the company that has already done our field. Um, and if it makes sense, I, my personal recommendation is, you know, they've proven themselves to us. I would stick with them. But if the costs and you guys know more about the financials behind or not, then let's make sure that the other vendor uh, is as credible, and I just don't know enough about them. So, but my uh, suggestion here is please move forward with that. I think the town um, is 110% behind you. There are several thousand children that use that field from every youth sport. Even baseball uses it when it's raining. Um, and the amount of money that that field has saved by keeping us off grass fields, and they go on the turf so we're not destroying the grass field, uh, is not little pennies we're talking about because when once those grass fields get ruined it affects the entire season and then the, what do players do they run to a different field where they're going to beat that one up too and then we as a town end up having to fix all of that so every high school in the state of Connecticut is going to turf they're not going the other way around uh, because the end result is the maintenance on it is so much better and less expensive and yes it's expensive to put that in but in the long run there is a return on investment, and we've had eight years of that return in surplus. So I would say move forward with it. It's time to fix it. And um, thank you for your service. Thank you, Dan. Other comments this evening? Public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Um, council reports? Tony? Uh, Public Works Committee met on Thursday night. Uh, the main topic was the uh, artificial turf and the public work committee did make a recommendation to bring this forward to town council for approval tonight at the same time uh, we got an update from staff on the uh, Stillman roof replacement they're going to talk to historical uh, district uh, on that now to uh, uh, get that moving forward and we received uh, assessments reports on the exterior conditions of both the Dennis standing house and the Solomon Wells house which we'll have to take a while to review before we can come back and go over that. Thanks, Tony. Other council reports, Mike, anything? Thanks. Amy? Um, I attended the library board monthly meeting. They are continuing to discuss their rebranding of the library. Uh, they have ongoing budget discussions, and they also had, um, they discussed a patron's request for a book relocation. Um, and then I, we attended the Memorial Day Parade as part of the committee. Um, it was a wonderful event, and this year it was um, dedicated to Larry Spellacy, who was the chairperson of that committee for a long time, who passed away right before the um, parade, and Tom Mahar was this year's speaker. 
Thank you, Amy. Council comments? Any council comments? Uh, Don? Um, yeah, the Grants Way Foundation um, asked me just to let everyone know that the competitive softball tournament is coming up Friday evening, June 9th, and Saturday, June 10th at Millwoods Park. They are a 501c3 organization, and they are working on raising money for the footbridge project at Millwoods to link field two with field one. They're about a little over halfway there, so they continue to work um, and raise more money so that they can um, fund that project. So if anybody's interested in watching some good softball, um, Friday and Saturday, uh, please come down to the park. <coughs> there will be food um, and some good games to watch. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Amy? Um, I had the opportunity to attend several wonderful events in town this past weekend. Uh, we had the Mayor's Ball, the Historical Society had their uh, biannual house tour, the fireworks at the Cove, and the Keene Foundation's uh, annual 5K. I just wanted to acknowledge and thank all of the volunteers for their countless hours um, to support all these great events. And um, I was so happy to see so many town residents enjoying them. Thanks, Amy. Comments. Okay. Town manager. Uh, just one thing this evening, Mr. Mayor, the uh, fuel tank replacement project at uh, Physical Services goes well. The old tanks were removed from the ground. The soil testing showed that there was no leakage. So that saved a ton of potential money right there. So the hole's been filled in. We are now waiting for the new tanks to be delivered. Again, these will be above ground tanks. So as we wait, uh, the contractors doing what work they can to get prepared. Um, we're on temporary uh, filling stations that were brought in by the contractors, so uh, that project goes well. Terrific, thank you so much, Jeff. Dolores, anything from your end? Uh, June is dog uh, registration month in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we have, we, to, uh, for the last part, of, since June 1st, we've tagged uh, 300 dogs. We have about 1,500 more to go. Mine's done. <laughs> 2,000 dogs. <laughs> well, any of us who uh, campaign know how many dogs there are. <laughs> I can tell you that every time I go up to a door. So, amazing. Thank you, Flores. Okay, we'll move on to council action. Uh, we don't have any uh, board appointments, uh, commission appointments, uh, no unfinished business, so we'll move right to 4A. The Tone field discussion. Make a motion to accept the bid from Sprint Turf LLC for the replacement of synthetic surface on Catone Field, including alternatives numbers two through five, for one million one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Jeff, I know you're going to take us through some of the points. Yes, Luke McCoy with Castle Booze, who we've engaged for engineering and project management, is here this evening to kind of go through what the project is and where we are after tonight. So I'll ask Luke to kind of. It's the best place to put a board. Right there. there. Right, right, right there. Right. Yeah. I'll let set that up. So he's got a, a new rendering or picture of what it would look like done. With the W. Nice. Has been updated. As yes. Asked. So there we go. Um, so it kind of looks purple. I know it's hard for everybody. Yeah, maybe to turn see. a little bit for the. Uh, we we can see it probably easier than uh, the public. So more toward the public. Yeah, Great. There you go. So, um, you guys can see it. All right. So since we met last time, uh, we have further developed. We had a number of stakeholder meetings, uh, developed the overall plans, documents. Uh, as was mentioned, we did go out to bid. Uh, the base bid uh, was the removal of the existing system, so the, the turf carpeting, the, the green part, and the infill, uh, disposal of that, and replacement with a new synthetic carpeting and new infill, uh, as well as uh, the new logo. And along the end of the soccer field, there's a uh, removable netting system that allows for the teams to have joint practices. They were having some issues with lacrosse and soccer. The balls were rolling back and forth between little and big. So that will be put in and it can be removed. Um, also is included uh, is the conversion of little to be able to use for varsity softball. So as you can see here, uh, the markings on it, that would all be turf. So that infield 
uh, infilled um, area there that's in the brown or the tan that's actually turf it's just a different color so during the other seasons when it's not being used for softball or for youth community uh, they'd still have full use of Little Catone. Uh, we will be uh, as part of the project also included an outfield fence for softball which would be set up uh, for the softball season and then removed and used um, off to the side during uh, other sports play on it so it wouldn't be in the way as well. Uh, as part of the project we also bid a couple of different alternates. Um, one um, was the reuse of the existing infill that was out there. Um, that is an alternate that could potentially save some money up front, but in the long run that will have to be replaced. Uh, it's our opinion that that probably won't make it another full 10 to 14 years, which is the anticipated of the turf system, uh, which is why we broke it as an alternate. So you do have the option to look at doing that as part of this now to save some money, but keep in mind you will at some point have to do that. So it may make sense to do it now with the project and the benefits of the uh, alternate infill that we talked about last time being the green in color, reducing the heat effect on it uh, with that. We also had a series of alternates for different netting systems, uh, which would help for, it's hard to see, but on the far side, it would be the backstop for softball, uh, as well as off of the right field for the baseball field that's above Catone Field um, there, and then one other small section that's behind um, to the bottom there where you can see the white that's where they practice and have a goal set up there and balls are continuously going into the uh, woods with it um, there's also an electrical box which would be set behind the field uh, it's set in place so that the turf and the system wouldn't have to be um, disturbed later on shall you decide to run power over to the softball field so the conduit the box all of that would be there it could be a future project to actually pull power down from the poles for that uh, that was a request from softball uh, for future for pitching machines things of that nature um, base bid also includes the drag behind maintenance equipment for the new field so that the staff would be all set up with being able to continue to maintain the field with their own resources here uh, within the town. Um, I think that's it. As uh, was mentioned, I believe is in your packet, there were two two different bids, uh, sprint turf and field turf. Uh, we did sit down and hold scope review with both uh, because the bids were so close and there were only two. We felt it was worthwhile to do both. Um, both were able to go through the bid documents with ourselves, uh, talk about schedule, contract, and the required product, uh, and all, in our opinion, uh, vetted out at the scope review. And we do not see any issue with either contractor uh, based on our review of what they provided. And I have experience working with both, I should add, too. So that, I will answer any questions. Questions for Luke? Mike? Um, I just had a question, well, kind of a comment on the, the outside the fencing for the softball field, that that won't be removable during the softball um, season so that soccer wouldn't be playing there. I just want to clarify that for people that think that they used to play there in the spring that they won't be playing there in the spring because it won't be removable for the weekends or anything. Correct. So okay. there will be some scheduling changes just during the spring, uh, which I think we determined starts the third week of March and then goes to right around end of May for the varsity softball season. And that field, I should also mention, there was talk that that could also be used for um, youth baseball, Little League baseball, based on the side during that while the fencing is up uh, with the use of a portable mound uh, there as well. So. And all youth softball. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then did we talk to Mike Maltesi about the baseball fencing? He was thinking maybe it wasn't needed. Was he followed up with? We I remember did. last Wednesday. We did get conversation that actually Mike came out to the Public Works Committee. I think at this point... We're recommending accepting the alternates and we'll vet those as we go. I think Kathy Bagley sees a value to having that screen there. It will stop the line drive balls that impact the surface of Catone. But he didn't think it was necessary? Or? We haven't gotten that in-depth conversation with okay. him. But you're not going to stop a sky ball that comes over the top no matter what you do. The idea was to stop line drives that could hit in a line shot kids on the field from the other okay. side. And this would be a, probably a comment for the town manager. Could we get a policy over the gate receipts? Who owns the gate receipts? I mean, it, we since we own the, all the doing the outside of these fields and we don't own the inside of the schools, wouldn't we own the gate receipts by law or by town 
Uh, you would have to get the town attorney to weigh in on that. Could we get the town attorney to weigh in on that? Uh, that, that discussion should happen, obviously, separate from this, but along with some of the other questions that were raised this evening, which I'm sure we've already begun thinking about. So, Luke, my question for you, the deduct 212 off of the proposed bid award, that, that's what you were referring to in terms of the soil undersurface? It's the um, infill material that goes within uh, the carpet, the synthetic field. So currently you have a mixture of what we call SBR, crumb rubber and sand um, that would be extracted and disposed of uh, along with the field uh, the base bid was to have all new infill which is coated green rubber and sand combination that deduct alternate yes would be to extract it and reuse it within the field I believe use uh, the existing yes um, how much of that would you guess as a percentage over the 12 years has d dissipated removed or washed away <laughs> It, it's not a lot overall and the amount of it. Um, it, it does move, um, it does compact. Um, the problem becomes in the way that we uh, want to see it installed. Um, it can, it all mixes together so it's no longer uh, layered, um, but it becomes difficult to, to separate in the extraction process and put back in. But over the lifetime of it, the sand, because um, it's a natural and some of the, uh, not so much the chrome rubber, it will break down slightly, but the sand and others, they change particle size so they have a different performance uh, to them. So that's what we're concerned with. Although they're performing well now and may perform well when they're first put in, it's over the second lifespan of that infill, we will see it start to deteriorate. And in our um, experience with that, usually it does have to be replaced at some time during the second turf life cycle. So. It is a, it can be done, but it is not a simple and it is not inexpensive to do later on. And is the materials being proposed in the new setup notably different in terms of composition, quality, and lifespan? Uh, yes and no. The expect, uh, expect, expectation out of it is similar to what you've gotten out of your field, but because your field is 14 years older, technology is much different now. It's, it's, it's like comparing a... I guess you could say a Honda Accord that's 14 years old, you know, they were very reliable, good cars then. The newer Honda Accords are still classified by car drivers as a good, reliable car, but the technology in them is very different from, you know, how it connects to your phone and all that. Same things happen with turf. So we're looking at, um, again, utilizing a slit film fiber, which is what you had, but introducing a, a newer uh, monofilm as well, which helps with performance. Um, and the overall goal of it is to, again, get you uh, 10, 12, 14, maybe 15 years out of the field. So it, it's kind of hard to say exactly yes. But there is a lot more technology in. Um, the biggest thing is the UV uh, degradation of the fibers. They've changed that process now where it's actually part of the resin and it's in the individual fibers, the green fibers you see, whereas before uh, a lot of it was just coated on top of the fibers, which is where we saw it wore away and the fibers started to break down because of UV. I noticed in the bid spec uh, that Sprint talked about a 16-year warranty in their language. That is required for the pad that is going underneath the turf, uh, which is part of the new turf. So that is going to uh, be warranted for this cycle and the next cycle. And we talked about that last time. What that does is not only does it help to guarantee the safety of the field over both lifetimes, because uh, currently ASTM is really looking um, is 200 Gs under the GMAX. They're proposing to change that down to 165 in the next year, which means all fields, um, they haven't quite answered whether the old ones are gonna be grandfathered in or not, but a as a town, it's kind of hard when a, when a safety standard gets lowered to say, well, ours is under the old standard um, with that. What this does is it guarantees that GMAX to be 120 or below over both life cycles. Uh, it also guarantees the HIC, which is the European head and body safety standard, uh, to be below the uh, industry standard. The th third thing it does is it reduces the cost at your next life cycle because now we have the pad there, your turf profile, which used to be two and a half inches for this now with the pad is inch and three quarters with the infill. When you go to replace this field in 12, 14 years, you're only buying the carpet and the infill, not the pad, and the carpet is a lower profile and there's less infill in it. So it will save the town money in the long run as well. 
Jody. Luke, just a couple of questions for clarity. I have, we obviously have the opportunity to sit on the uh, Infrastructure Department of Public Works Committee, so I've heard a lot of it, but I think it might be helpful for the others to hear. The system we have set up now, could that even take real turf? Natural grass turf? Mm -hmm. um, yes, but with a significant amount of work. So what we currently have now, uh, and I'll kind of walk through the layers, is the top is your, your turf system and your infill. You have about two and a half inches of your turf and about two to two and a quarter inches of infill is what you should have. Um, then below that, we have two layers of drainage stone. Uh, what would have to happen, because along the edge there's a walkway and there's a curb, which is sets our elevation, we'd have to actually go in and remove four to six inches of that drainage stone to put in enough root zone mix or loom or topsoil, as many people refer to, to give a growing medium for natural grass. So that would be the first process to do. And you have on this field, I believe it's about 140 to 150,000 square feet of area. Multiply that times about six inches of material to come out. Your trucking costs are going to be between for disposal, I've seen as low as 20 up to $35 a cubic yard, if not more, depending on if the material can be used. So it adds up. Then you have to bring in the topsoil, the loom material, and then you have to bring in the seed uh, material. In my recommendation doing athletic facilities, I would not recommend doing sod. I would recommend a um, mechanical seeding that would be done in three stages and the field would be shut down for a year in order to get the correct growth for natural grass to be able to handle football and lacrosse because of the heavy youth. You want that root structure to be able to grow as least as deep as the grass is high. You can't get that with sod because it's put on the top. It will start to grab, but within the first year, if you're playing on it when it's wet, it gets a lot of heavy use, that sod is going to die or move or break down and then you're back to square one again. So anytime we do athletic fields, we really try to recommend to owners to mechanically seed and give a proper year of use. So the field would be down for a year, which I know isn't necessarily a cost, but it, it is a factor with it. Additionally, what you'll run into is the overall use of that facility cannot handle the number of hours you use it now. Uh, by going to natural grass. It just physically can't. There's been studies done, Penn State, Tennessee University, uh, who weed, Yukon as well, but, but they lead the industry in natural grass um, colleges. That's what they do. They have departments for that. Uh, they found that between 150 to 200 events per year is all that you can put on natural grass fields. Uh, that's about a season and a half of a varsity and a JV sport. That's it. So um, we know through our meetings uh, with the stakeholders that that field's used far more than that. And that doesn't include using it and when it's wet, using it when it's too dry, you know, those kind of things. So, and irrigation should also be an added cost. You know, that's probably a field and a half. We usually ballpark about $30,000 per field, so you're probably around $40,000 for irrigation on top of that too to install that. Thank you for that. Um, another opportunity is to just kind of explain the penalty for any company that won't be finishing this on time or if we have issues there is some sort of catch-all correct there is correct so in the bid documents we did a couple of things one was we um, prepared and put a draft copy of the town's contract so that they had the ability to review that prior to bidding so that we could expedite the contract uh, agreement with them knowing that the schedule is tight so that there's no upfront getting going. Uh, additionally, we have liquidated damages for failure to complete the project by mid-August, which is the start of the fall sports program, uh, and that is $1,000 a day. Um, obviously, attached to that is weather conducive if we get continuous summer of rain like we've had this spring, um, we may need to look at that date. But there is enough window in there for typical rain, you know, missing a day or two here along the process. But it is $1,000 per day. And both of the bidders um, answered through the scope review that they are aware of that and are uh, can meet the schedule. And through this process, should we choose to move forward tonight, some of the turf we currently have could be recycled for batting cages? 
Yes, that was discussed, so that that was a question asked of can that be put down under the batting cages to help reduce the uh, amount of maintenance constantly going on with the stone dust in there. And yes, both have agreed that they can uh, uh, keep that. Additionally, the uh, carpeting that is being removed is required to be reused, repurposed, or recycled. Uh, and we have asked for a chain of custody uh, of that process. So anything that comes off will not be sent to a landfill as part of this removal process. It will either be repurposed, which means it's made into something else. It'll be reused where it's shipped and, and reused um, in other things such as batting cages where it's cut up, things like that, or it's recycled um, into something else. And last question, um, there's a, a time frame where once they have the almost finished product, yes. we get to test it out for a month and if we have issues, they come back to do fixes? Yes, so there's a, a, a multiple series of reviews and tests. So one is we start with what we call submittal process where they have to formally submit all the documentation of the product for which they are going to put on your field and we review that again. Again, that's in the bid documents as well. Um, then the product is manufactured um, before it is shipped to the site, the first round of testing happens and that confirms that the product as made is what we specified and it gives us a baseline for the performance and safety testing of the system. So we get data of that turf system being tested in a laboratory. The field then shows up, they install it, we have testing along the way. Um, first round is we do a punch list, we review, and we have the first round of testing, which is GMAX, uh, HIC, and infill depth and planarity along the field. That allows us to open the field up for use uh, in that middle of August. The town is then open to use the field for the next 30 to 60 days, which allows the field to settle, uh, work itself in. Then they're required to come back, they groom the field, and we do the second round of testing, which includes those safety, but then also the performance. And this checks any of the infill that may have settled, moved around, all of that, and they have to recap the field, uh, redistribute, and make sure it passes all those testing um, so that they <coughs> then from there turn it over to you for your eight-year warranty on the project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, just a little bit on the timing. So we approved this tonight. When, when does it start? Was that? No, <laughs> um, so the goal would be if it is approved, we move into contract negotiations with them. We then have two to three weeks of um, submittals back and forth, another two to three weeks of manufacturing and testing. Uh, the project then would really see someone in with our intent is throughout July, we'd start to see uh, mobilization, removal, the base prep, testing of the base, and then installation of the new carpeting for the end of July into early August. Um, field would, as we call, go green, which means the majority uh, is green and there's some lines, and then they start the inlays, then they do the installation of the infill through the beginning part of August for that uh, initial opening of the middle of August. And so how much, I mean, there's a little bit of time built in Yes. obviously for weather, but how much time would be built in for that? So there's a couple different ways around it. Um, the contractors, both of them have agreed that, you know, if it rains one day during the week, they may work a Saturday. Um, they also said they prefer not to for their guys, but if they need to work Saturday, Sunday to take two days off. Additionally, because you have lights on the field, it allows them to work longer days if they need to make it up. Um, they're not, at, not, not used to doing that in the summer just because it's the busy season for doing this. So guys may work 10, 12 hour days or may work two shifts out there because of the ability of the lights. So that's how we would make up a day or two of rain that may happen during the week uh, with it. Yes, Mike. Couple more questions. Um, do you know how other towns usually pay for their turf field? You've been through this a lot, so. It's, um, it's all over. So okay. um, some have had what they call rainy day funds, which are money put away for things, or it could have been they, oh, how do I say, they've, they've won various lawsuits from different things, whether it be finding corporations who were, you know, putting discharge into stormwater rather than treating it, and they keep that money and squirrel it away and use it for projects like this. Uh, others have bonded them. Others have done a leasing program through a turf manufacturer. Uh, they've gone through banks and done it. Um, others are just fortunate enough that they 
squirrel money away and, and can do it. Um, the last one, a few instances, it's been private donations that have come to the table uh, in those towns. But I, I've seen all different ways. It really depends where, how, uh, and whatnot. So. Okay, a tougher question. One of uh, Bristol's fields that had sprint turf put them in is having issues. Can you explain the issues that they're having? Um, a little bit, although I'm not involved in that, so I want to be careful yep. you know, what I know. I understand that um, both of the fields in Bristol were actually um, installed by sprint turf at Central High School and Eastern High School. I do know that both schools have the exact same system uh, designed and installed at both, so it's a stone-based pad. Same tariff safe, some same suppliers for all of it. Um, as far as I know, the only difference between is the anchoring system around the outside. One is 100% uh, glued, one is nailed. Uh, my understanding is that the one that was nailed uh, is having some issues with the curb, uh, the carpet uh, moving. Um, but without being involved in it, there could be a lot of factors. I don't know the design from that design firm of the carpeting. Uh, itself, I don't know the backing weight. Um, were they doing a two-part or a three-part backing, which allows for that deformation of it? Uh, was the coating, you know, 12, 15 ounces, where it really should be 21, 27 ounces at that type of a face weight? Uh, I, I don't know to be able to give all the answers. Um, I'll probably be able to find out once it's resolved, but right now um, there's not a lot of discussion of it. Okay, because you would think Sprint Turf would know since they've done it a lot? that they should have known the issue when they were putting it in. How is ours gonna be done? So that's a two part question. Yep. So that gets into a tricky part when you have a engineer telling you what to do. You know, so I, I can't necessarily speak to that. Um, I can tell you here that uh, myself, I have um, over 15 years of experience doing these. I've never had that issue on a field. Uh, our specification uh, does require the three-part backing and the heavy backing uh, coating on it, uh, as well as the product will be tested um, prior to shipping here for that deformation of the backing material. Uh, there's laboratory tests that are done to check that before it arrives. And not only does it check it, but it confirms that what is made uh, is what we specified. So there's no commonly referred to as a bait and switch along the process uh, of getting here. So, but um, in regards to this product and the low bid manufacturer Sprint Turf, I have worked with them on systems that are almost identical to yours at uh, Kennedy High School in Waterbury, Manchester High School, Simsbury High School, um, and there's one more that I can't think of in the last couple of years alone. So, and I haven't had an issue on this. Did they do Plainville? They did, yes, but not on a pad. Uh, it was on a regular stone base, but yes, they did do the two uh, in Plainville. So you don't think there'd be any difference between field turf, who did this field, kind of knows it, and sprint turf? In speaking directly as a design consultant for that, no. I think it's it's a field replacement. They're, they're two, one's a rectangle, one's a square, and the process can be had. Um, I've reviewed both of them in detailed scope reviews. Uh, I don't see any issue with either of the bidders. They seem competent and carried everything. Um, and I do know that they both can meet the testing requirements set forth in the specifications because I have worked with both of them uh, before. So I think they're both competent. Uh, I could not find through our scope room uh, anything that they didn't appear to carry. Okay, thank you. One of the alternates that isn't included tonight is the perimeter fencing. There was some discussion and some desire on behalf of the BOE to replace the uh, golden rope that prevents people from accessing the field during events with fencing. Um, there's a unit price, but we don't have a quantity yet. So we may bring that back to you once we figure out because the school has some different ideas on how much fencing to include and we just don't have linear footage to include tonight in that proposal. So we may bring that back to you uh, at the next meeting. There is a difference between sprint turf and field turf of, you know, I think it's less than $20,000. $14,000. $14,000. Yeah. Yep. But we don't, we can't find a reason not to approve the low bidder based upon their performance in other areas. Other questions for Luke? 
Jeff, are you uh, going to chat a little bit about the economics in terms of how I know this is approval for the authorization? Yes. The well, as you saw in the agenda packet, what we would do next meeting is bring back a lease purchase like we did on the original turf or like the town did 14 years ago and pay for it over seven or eight years with the first payment not being in next fiscal year but the 18-19 fiscal year. So this does not impact the budget you just adopted at all. The net effect really of that is you get an eight-year warranty from a third-party vendor. That's why the eight years is max on these things. So we would look at a seven-year lease, so the term of the warranty and the term of the financing uh, exhaust at the same time. So roughly, you know, the cost of this adds about $179 a year or $179,000 a year into your to lease payments, which isn't bad because you have other stuff falling off as we go down into those years. Do you remember the economics on this field and when it stopped? Annually, what it roughly was and when it finished? It was about $100,000. It wasn't vastly different than this? Than no, this no. Cause you, because as Luke said, you know, if we were just doing straight turf, you're not paying as much. But you, my understanding, and I wasn't here at the time, as, as you heard from Luke, the construct of this whole thing was pretty massive. You excavated, you brought in fill, you created a concrete curb, you did, you know, all these drainage and so forth. So the, the cost originally just didn't include a, a carpet. You, re, you built an entire field system. Correct. So that added to the value. Other questions? Um, thank you very much. Appreciate that you uh, surfaced right at the right time about 60 days ago. I remember when we first started talking about the field and uh, appreciate your competent and <coughs> capable work on our behalf. And it sounds like you'll be with us through the finish run here. Yes, uh, they have engaged to continue through the rest of bidding and the getting the contractor on and then afterwards overseeing uh, the construction all the way through till we finally sign off and you have your warranty in hand uh, from there. Thank you. So, you know, both Kathy, uh, excuse me, both Sally Katz and Derek Greger went to the same scoping meetings have been involved in this as well. So we've had staff in the middle of it as well. And thank you to Luke and Castle Booze. We called you at the last minute and so far you're able to, to perform. So, so that's far. very much appreciated. No problem. We're here. And I'll, uh, I'll leave this over here for you, you, the board. Any uh, council comments before we do the motion? Jody? I just want to kind of echo what Mike said, and I think it's a point taken very well by some of the, the folks in the residents that came out to speak tonight, is that we really should pursue doing some sort of policy um, with regard to trying to collect revenues to sustain this moving forward so that we're not in the position again in the future. I just think it behooves us to do that. I believe Jeff has that in his mind directive based on those comments, I think, previously as well. So thank you, Jody. So uh, before I vote, just to share a couple of things I think that most of us probably agree on. I know the topic of the, of the field replacement came up uh, later in the year prior to our budget discussion. We had a, a fair amount of uh, interested party participation led by some of the folks that are here tonight, which I, I thank you. Although sparse in number, you were the guys that kind of stayed with this right from the beginning, and I know we've had meetings with you uh, initiating this. And, and frankly, although the field was on our screen uh, prior to that, particularly in your case, Mike, when you came and saw us, um, we were not sure it was a requirement this year, but over the course of that process and the evaluation by Luke's company uh, and the input from parents and parents who had injured daughters, like in Dave's case. I think we put that information together and it, it, it fostered, I think, in the mind of all of us here, uh, more urgency about it. And that was a byproduct, I think, of educating ourselves uh, with, with the process. So, and I think th we obviously have dissenting points of view in the community about the expense of redoing the field, continuing to have a field, um, and whether or not this is the right timing and given everything that's hitting our budget. Um, obviously, one of the things that Jeff has done a really good job with is timing uh, this expenditure as well as the funding of it, which is a, a bit of a pleasant surprise that the first year of our fiscal budget for next year, which is when this comes into play, will not be impacted. Um, I don't think uh, the councilors believe that that is a kicking of the can down the sidewalk for expense purposes. I think it's a creative solution that allows us to match it with the warranty, but also 
if those of us who have looked at our bonding and our funding, as well as our budget impacts, um, it fits more nicely with some things that are coming off at the time that this comes on and mar marginalizes the impact on our operating budget. So that's a, a bit of a pleasant surprise in my mind. I think uh, prior to that development this past week, uh, we were looking at some of the CREC money uh, to do the inert first year funding and possibly uh, would have had to look at some of the principal there, which I think would have been a bit more controversial. Uh, so I'm glad that we have not had to do that. Uh, and obviously, as a blanket statement, we are still very much aware that our budget is, although passed, as we shared when we did pass it, uh, it is still very much uh, an open topic. And uh, the state passed a legislative bill uh, that we got uh, the language of today uh, to allow for a reopener for all municipalities in the event that we get impacted by the state's final budget, which still remains to be seen. Uh, something that we talked about we hoped would happen, it absolutely has happened, uh, might be under the category, be careful what we wish for, because by allowing that they may be planning to uh, impact us, but we, we hope, at least in Weathersfield, that that won't happen. So um, I do think that this project absolutely is imperative that we move forward. Um, I certainly subscribe to the group of the community that believes that athletic fields are very much integral to uh, what our community uh, needs and continues to have as an amenity as part of what we offer. Not only our, our children, but I think our community sees that as a statement of the quality of our facilities. Um, I don't know that m most of the academic folks would agree with you, Dave, about it, athletics being more important than the schoolroom. Uh, I think probably most of us would hope that. Our students want to be in the classroom more than the fields, although that's probably in practical reality closer to your thought. But um, at any rate, I, I, I think the whole academic experience uh, together with uh, our extracurricular and athletics, I think makes for hopefully as whole a student as we hope comes out of our Weathersfield school system for higher education or beyond. So um, very much support this. I think Jeff's done an outstanding job with Michael Neal getting the funding figured out. Um, Luke's done a terrific job in his company representing us. Um, so, you know, I certainly support this. I think it's prudent. Nobody likes to spend money, but maintaining such an important part of our facilities uh, is very important. And to Jody's point, I certainly think Jeff will apprise us of strategies that we can have discussions in the coming six months about how to properly address what I think was kind of an elusive set of facts on uh, funding, gate receipts, and where they were going. I think all those things found themselves somewhere, but I think we might need to do a little bit more prudent observation of that and oversight frankly even though we don't have direct control of some of that at this point we can entertain that so we have a motion a second we've had discussion uh, I'd like to move the question all in favor aye, aye. opposed abstentions I oppose thank you Anthony okay I believe we just have an ordinance for introduction Motion to hold a public hearing at a meeting of the town council to be held on, held on June 19th, 2017 at 7 p.m. in the town council chambers at the town hall on a resolution entitled Resolution Authorizing the Issuance of Not Exceeding $5,500,000 Refunding Bonds for Payment in Whole or in Part of the Outstanding Principal of Any Interest and Any Call Premium on the Town of Wethersfield's Six million eight hundred fifty-five thousand. I'm sorry. Six million eight hundred fifty-five thousand dollars general obligation bonds issue of two thousand nine, and twenty-two million dollar general ob obligation bonds issue of twenty fourteen, and for the costs related thereto, and that the town clerk public and post notice of such public hearing, and that the full text of the proposed resolution be published in the minutes of this meeting. Second. Okay. Motion a second. Um, that's just for introduction. Do we, have, we don't have to go down this, do we? we? Yeah. You do for the open resolution. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Minutes of uh, May, 5th, May 11th fr first. I'd like to make a motion to approve the special meeting minutes of May 11th. Second. Changes? Amendments, changes? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And the minute, minutes of May 15th, please. I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of May 15th, 2017. Second. Thank you. Any changes or deletions on the 15th meeting? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Thank you. Uh, public comment. Tom.
Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. <clears throat> so I just want to share something with everyone here. Um, you know, I get up here and speak. I'm not an expert on everything. You know, maybe I don't get the story straight. But the townspeople, you know, we get to see an agenda, uh, a budget item with a brief description uh, of what it entails. You know, I looked at the bid spec. Um, we don't get to hear all the conversations that went on with your staff and so on. Uh, so I have questions. I come up here, I ask questions. Unfortunately, it's not a give and take scenario. Uh, I don't mind being corrected, you know. But maybe some more of this information could be presented to the public when you, when you are voting on an item. Uh, I still would like to see, you know, what is the use of the field? Yeah, there's people here that are involved in uh, high school athletics and uh, youth sports, and they may know the volume of people that use that field. I, I don't. Um, it would be nice to say there was 5,000 people attended as spectators football games. There's six or seven football games a year, I believe. You know, how many people went through the gate? You know, what's the harm in that? That shows the rest of the town. See, this is a popular place. It does get a lot of use. Hey, maybe it's worth it, you know? Um, how often is the field leased? Does, does midget football pay for use of the field? Does Ritchie soccer pay for use of the field? I don't know. I thought that was the intent, that they had to chip in to use the field. If they do pay, what were the revenues? Nobody can, can tell us that. I know Mr. Young's asked for a lot of those numbers. and you know, First it was go to the Board of Ed, then it was go to the town manager, back and forth. Um, I did see some of that uh, information that was provided by the Board of Ed. And to be honest, it looks like a, it's a catch-all fund. If you want to take the football team captains out for lunch, you charge it to that account. Those line items are actually in the spreadsheet that we were given. So that's not any kind of way to run the thing. Uh, and I think that the Board of Ed should kick in to the maintenance costs of that field. They're not going to pay the, it's not going to add up to the $90,000, but Maybe it's $10,000 a year. Anything would be better than nothing to defray the cost. Um, but I'd like to see more information provided to the public. Maybe, I don't know if you can post some, something on your website or whatever. Um, a couple <laughs> weeks ago, <clears throat> I came up here and spoke about the slate roof on the Stillman building. And I am absolutely not perfect. I, I don't like public speaking. Uh, I get nervous and lose my place, and uh, that's just reality. Maybe I'll get better at it. Um, in my discussion about slate roofs, I misspoke, and I said I inserted the word typical in front of slate roofs lasting two to 400 years. Well, it's not typical, but they have been known to last well over that. I, I got a copy of the report uh, that was prepared for the town by Tremco. I took the liberty of hiring a slate consultant to review the report and the comments are the roof needs to be replaced. So have at it, Tom, I told you so. Fact of the matter is the Tremco report didn't really specify all the reasons that the slate expert brought up. There was a lot of pictures about the collection system for water leaking through the roof and uh, a lot of pictures of the roof, uh, the ceilings stained with water. Uh, what wasn't mentioned in the report was that the slate on that building is uh, harvested from Pennsylvania. It's considered a soft slate. It's been known to last as little as 25 years in some cases. Uh, the roof is repairable, but it would not be reliable. 
If they were to go up there and replace 150 slate tiles, they would likely cause more damage to existing tiles that appear to be serviceable during their work. So his recommendation was, yes, replace the roof. So, okay, so I got it wrong. And, uh, you know, I'll own up to that. But I would have liked to have heard more discussion about what's wrong with the roof. Instead, we got the roof is shot, it needs to be replaced. We got that from uh, Mr. Bridges, Sally Katz, uh, um, Fred Bushy at the town. Everybody said the roof shot. You know, I just want a, an explanation of what's wrong with things. I'm not saying I want to micromanage the town. I'm just interested in, in what's being done. And I wish that uh, we could find a forum to share that information more. To, uh, maybe it's just me, I don't know. But a lot of people watch this on TV and they, they want to be uh, kept apprised of what's going on in the town. And is it a good deal or is it a bad deal? I don't know. I mean, you know, I'll say it again. I'm all for uh, youth athletics. Uh, I like to have a nice football field that I'm proud of uh, as a resident and taxpayer. And, you know, I, I, I hope the place is packed. But a lot of things that get promised don't, don't get followed through. I'd like to see some follow through on the gate receipts and the lease payments, okay? Um, the last time the field was renovated, I lived at 382 Church Street, which is on the west end of Church Street. And there was a big opposition to lighting the field. It had a lot of concerns about increased traffic and so on. And one of the things that was stated, you could go back through the minutes, is that there will be no access to Catone Field from either Westway or Church Street. There was a sign placed on my property, on the snow shelf, no access to Catone Field. After the first season, the town placed a burlap sack over that sign and duct taped it. And it stayed that way for about five years. There is plenty of access to Catone Field through Church Street. You can ask anybody. You could, I had contractors working at my house. They had their trucks parked in front. I said, my God, there's more traffic on, on this street than most of the side streets in town. Soccer moms pick up the kids. Everybody goes there. Maybe the gate's not open. Maybe they squeeze through the gate. Maybe they jump the fence, whatever. Plenty of access. The point I'm making is a lot of things get promised and then they don't get followed through. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm gonna just take a little liberty to share. Uh, I think you've been pretty active the last couple of years, Tom. And I think you mentioned recently you retired, so um, I'm glad to see you have some new time to do some inquiries and research, and I'm glad you're doing it. I actually have found your commentary to be very balanced and reasonable. I haven't always agreed everything you've said, and you and I have had conversations on the phone and met and talked about this stuff. So I encourage you to continue to participate, and I certainly feel you're more than uh, an adequate, comfortable speaker up in public. I've seen some people freeze completely in front of the mic and it's going to be scary and intimidating but I, I appreciate that you're doing that I do want to say that I think a lot of the information that you're referring to is available to the public if somebody's so interested uh, this turf packet for example I think is some 130 pages long that has many of the questions that you asked in the first five minutes are addressed and I think Luke covered some of them in the presentation about why not turf you know and he, he I think capably answered some of that which I think is helpful but in addition to the fact that um, some of the things that were not addressed have obviously been raised, uh, as Jody did this evening. I think Mike Hurley has raised them as well. And we agree with that concern to do that. We are trying to process this agenda item as, it's, as we see fit, knowing that that needs attention. And I do think that should be public. And I do think those, uh, frankly, I think most of the council that I spoke to was a little surprised at that account information when we first saw it, as I think Mr. Young uh, was able to get it raised raise some eyebrows here. How much of the truth versus the fear is still yet to be discussed, but rest assured that I think there's plenty of incentive at this council level to answer that. But you know, bottom line, keep coming, keep talking. It's all fine with the rest of us, I'm sure.
Someone else? Yes, in the back. Claudio Boria, 639 Highland Street. My question is on the contractual side of the uh, field. Uh, he spoke about the LDs, the uh, engineer, in the contract being, if you don't meet the date of August. Um, are there any other uh, LDs in the contract for, like, you know, performance or as you go along in the contract, if you don't meet certain specifics? I know it's warranted, but what if something happens and we have loss of field usage? Are there, you know, damages that the town will receive trying to protect it at its fullest amount? Because it's a lot of money that yes. we're spending to do this. There's and performance so, bonds, so forth, in the insurance. Yep. So there are LDs throughout the... Well, not liquidated image, but there's performance bonds, posted contractors' bonds, those kind of things. Okay. Thanks, Claude. And I, I do direct you to that packet because it does have all of that detailed information in there that is part of the negotiation going forward. <coughs> Bob? Good evening again. Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Not surprised that you passed this, this fast track deal for turf that a, only a minority is using that cost this much kind of, this kind of money. Yet tonight we heard that there was a tremendous amount of people using that field. Yet you've all seen how much revenues came in from that field. And there, there wasn't one analysis done here regarding how you're gonna pay for it. Yeah, I know you're gonna finance it. But the fact remains, coming up with $90,000 a year and whacking the citizens for that, the citizens who are going to use it should pay more. The citizens that don't use it shouldn't have to pay for it. But that's not how our government works. We're socialists. We all spread the cost across the board. And of course, the special interests or the, the one percenters in the town end up getting what they want. The other, others, tough luck. But anyway, you took in so little money on that field over the 14 years. And I understand that the board is returning $17,000 to the town council for they, they call it a surplus. That's what Polly Moon was saying. She's going to return $17,000. They're giving us a, roughly $18,000 to cover Luke's cost during the project. For his cost. Mm -hmm. they're, they're paying for the design, most of the design and the project management. Well, the way she put it, it was 17, 18, who cares? But the fact remains, for her to come up with that little bit of money over 14 years is pretty pathetic. And if that's a sign of how much, how good business people you are, that, that spells it all out. Pretty poor. Pretty poor that, that we would have thousands and thousands, I mean, for, if you heard a couple people talk, there was a lot of people going there. But obviously, they were not paying people. They probably nobody was collecting because everybody's having a, a grand old time and let the other suckers pay for it. And that's exactly how it is. As you know, the, you know the, we, we, keep, we keep digging ourselves into more debt. The manager talks about, oh, we get some debt paid off and we pick up another debt. Yeah, you picked up how much on that school? When is that going to drop off? And then all the trucks and the, and, the, and the equipment that you buy. You know, we need a break. But obviously the manager doesn't believe in giving the citizens a break, nor do the town council. You all voted in favor of it. All of you. And you, you you're the one who introduced it. Then we have the downgrades here in the state of Connecticut. Now we have S&P. 
global ratings that have downgraded the state of Connecticut besides Finch and Moody's. And, you know, our economy, U.S. economy, uh, it is running at a slow 1.2%, and Connecticut is trailing behind it. And you keep spending like there's no tomorrow. And that's what you just did tonight. You couldn't care in the least, because in a few years you'll resign and move on and uh, let anybody else worry about it. And, but as far as your names, your names are attached to all of that. Your names will be remembered that you voted and that you, you spent all of this money. You have other things that you need to take care of that have been going on for even longer. And I don't see you even approaching those other issues. But something like this, a few of your pals come up and pat you on the back. I wanna, we wanna do something with the field. You were all hunky-dory with it, all of you. And then the citizens gotta pay for it because, because you gotta have your friends I call you friends and buddies uh, that you take care of. This is what I mean. Tonight, you took care of your friends and your buddies. Thank you very much, Mayor. I wish you luck with, the economy, with your economy. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, seeing one, uh, can I get a motion in executive session, please? Motion to go into executive session. Second. All in favor? Hi. Hi. Thank you.